request you first and foremost to uh, switch off all your mobile screens to yourselves. Uh, uh, please try and make some place for yourself. Yeah, that's what we have to do. Uh, fine. Okay, let me start. Uh, uh, welcome again to the second day of the advanced workshop on social theory organized by the uh, Center for Social Theory School of Development Studies, uh, DISS. Uh, we have the pleasure today, we had a very nice uh, round of discussions and exchange yesterday. For, uh, so I feel very bad for those of you who could not make it yesterday. So please be here today and do come tomorrow. It's uh, a very exciting thing that is going on here. Uh, we have the pleasure today of uh, having in our midst uh, Professor Romila Thapar, uh, you know. Uh, going by your response, it is almost uh, superficial and uh, superfluous rather <laughs> uh, to uh, give an introduction to her. Uh, but uh, she has been kind enough to suggest some, some readings uh, for you all, uh, which I had circulated yesterday in the uh, CD, which was distributed in the morning. Uh, so uh, you could always refer back to her, but uh, I'm assuming she will be discussing uh, some of her latest works uh, while she is discussing with you. Uh, she has agreed to sort of uh, put some core ideas on the table in front of you and then uh, sort of uh, seek your reactions and have a discussion with her. So since we are a large crowd today, uh, a little bit of uh, self-restraint will be very helpful. And please be uh, slightly uh, short, brief and pointed with the questions and uh, let her respond. Now we will break the uh, morning session into two halves. Uh, we'll take a break at uh, 40 at around quarter to 11. Take a quick tea break for about 15 minutes and then move from 11 to around uh, half past 12. And then uh, lunch is there for all of you at the guest house. So please don't go here and then please come for lunch. Um, one of the uh, reasons why uh, uh, we were very excited about <coughs> sorry, Professor Thapar coming here, uh, perhaps for the first time uh, in a public lecture like this uh, or a discussion like this is uh, that uh, is that uh, all of you are aware of the contemporary situation uh, in our country, uh, the political, economic, and social setup. And uh, she has been one of the key interventionists, especially from the side of an academician and as a public intellectual uh, in this uh, entire domain and controversy. Uh, so uh, it would be very nice to hear from her in person uh, some of her views. Uh, although I specifically requested her to focus a, a little bit on historiography and uh, you know the historical method, uh, because that I thought was uh, uh, sort of going to the core of the problem, uh, which has got very serious uh, political implications. And that topic is also a little bit in consonance with the theme of this uh, workshop. So without uh, further ado, uh, before we begin our usual honors, may I now request uh, Sunija to uh, give the institute shawl uh, to uh, Professor Thapar. Thank you. A big hand. So I leave it to all to Professor Papa to conduct the session. very widely. It's become absolutely fundamental to historical research and to the kind of historical writing that is being written these days. And yet there isn't enough understanding of it, um, even among social scientists, even on the public. So I will focus a little bit on that. <coughs> 
Um, the writing of Indian history, of course, begins in the 19th century under the auspices of colonial thinking and colonial writing. Uh, this is a transference of what was going on in Europe post-enlightenment, which various people brought to their colonies, various European writers. And the history of the colonies was interpreted in that light. Uh, therefore, I will go back to the colonial writing. I'll also go back to the colonial writing a little bit more than perhaps necessary because the debate today, the public debate on whatever is understood of history doesn't take into account the fact that a lot of the issues on which we have differences of opinion with members of the public is because the members of the public are completely unaware of the fact that their views are still grounded in the colonial understanding of the Indian past. And I hope that this issue will become clear as I go on to talk about it. The major change that takes place from, let's say, the early 19th century to, to now, or to the late 20th century, uh, is a change from treating history purely as narrative, the story of an event or the story of people involved in an event, um, to treating it also as needing to be analyzed that the event and the actions that people took need analysis. And the entry of analysis has become a very important component in history, which incidentally is absolutely lacking as far as the public perception of history is concerned. I am exaggerating this difference somewhat. Not everybody in the public is quite as um, hide bound by narrative as I'm suggesting, but I'm exaggerating it a little bit in order to draw out the difference between what professional historians today are doing and the kinds of attitudes that are taken up in the media and in popular writing and popular thinking. The difference then between narrative and analysis is also a difference which keeps cropping up all the time um, and which is a point of contention even amongst professional historians, which is the difference between myth and history. Is the narrative, does the narrative permit the entry of mythology into the story? Mythology in the sense that can you invent things as you go along? Or do you have to be absolutely strictly governed by confirmed evidence as the professional historians would like to believe. The other aspect which is important is that in the 19th century, and this is just to give you a backdrop, uh, the two things that happened, one is that the enlightenment thinking uh, is up to a point brought to bear on the history of the colony. And the second thing is that one of the features of colonialism across the board, whether it's British, French, German, Spanish, what you will, one of the features of colonialism was the invention of the concept of civilization. Now this is a concept that of course we've all grown up with and we continually hear about you know, what a great civilization we had or what a great civilization the Chinese had, or how great was the civilization of the Greeks and the Romans and so on. Now this concept of civilization, which began in the 18th century, to simply mean that some societies have art, literature, philosophy, and so on, what used to be called the higher life and some societies don't, or there are segments of societies that conform to the higher life and indulge in it, and there are others that, that do not. That was then transferred 
into saying that it is uh, to understand the world. And now remember, this is colonialism in the early 19th century, <coughs> uh, trying to sort out what the world was all about, because they've got colonies dotted all over the world. The Spanish and Portuguese have colonies in Latin America, or have had them. Uh, the French have colonies in Southeast Asia, tried India, didn't work. The Danes, the Dutch, the Germans, every little European country, and the British, of course, have colonies all over. So they are sorting out world history. And the way they do it is to say, we divide the world into civilizations. And you can have uh, six, you can have 10, you can have 16, you can have 26, depending on who you are as a historian and how you're dividing it up. What is the, um, the criterion of judging a society as being part of a civilization? Um, it has to have a confirmed territory. The territorial markers have to be very clear. And in the Indian case, it was interestingly the territory of British India. Nobody went back to saying, how do, you, how do we define Jambu Dweepa? How do we define Bharat Varsha? How do we define uh, Al Hind? Or any of the terms that were used for geography in the past, or cosmology actually. Uh, but it's British Indian territory. This is Indian civilization. Secondly, it has to have a single classical language. So uh, where there was Greek and Latin for Europe and Chinese for China, it was Sanskrit for India. This automatically gives a direction to the concept of civilization because there's a focus on using uh, sources from that particular language. Um, nobody talks about Persian sources or nobody talks about some of the early regional language sources as being constituents of Indian civilization, is all the Sanskrit. And it had to have one religion. So the religion of India was the majority religion, which was Hinduism. So you've got your three components of civilization, and these three components live with us to this day. If you ask anybody to define Indian civilization, they will tell you it's the subcontinent of India, it's Sanskrit language, it's the Hindu religion. Okay, how does this concept then come to be torpedoed a little bit as it comes to be in the late 20th century? Uh, first of all, we realize that uh, territories are never stable. Boundaries change constantly. And if there's one thing that history teaches us, it is that there is no stable boundary ever. Every century, the whole structure of boundaries change. Uh, part of this, is, of course, is due to the fact that there were no linear boundaries until you had the invention of maps. Because obviously, where would you draw the lines? You had to have something graphic, uh, describing, illustrating a country. And then you could sit and draw lines and say, you know, this belongs to this, and this belongs to that, and so on. So until the invention of cartography, which invention goes to about the 15th, 16th centuries in Europe, there were no boundary lines. Frontier zones existed. And so you had rivers and forests and deserts and mountains marking the difference between the territory of one region and another. And the great advantage of frontier zones, unlike boundaries, is that you weren't fighting for every inch of your sacred soil. The frontier zone was big. It was a zone where cultures and societies overlapped because some of these people came in and some of those people came in and settled in the frontier zone and you had mixed cultures. And so you had mixed cultures all across the world uh, wherever there were frontier zones. Uh, this meant that the idea of civilization being self-contained and, and completely cut off one from the other, going its own way, 
having its own characteristics which were deeply, deeply marked, that this was questioned. And people began to realize that the boundaries of civilizations are porous. People come and go. And one of the things that illustrated this, many things illustrated this, but one which illustrates it very dramatically is, you all heard of the Silk Route, which the media is making much of these days. There was a trade route that went from China through Central Asia, through West Asia, through the Mediterranean. And along this route, you had goods traveling, Chinese silk in vast quantities. There were bowls of silk that were given as, as gifts and as presents to people all along the route, uh, what we would today call corruption, but which in those days was called gift exchange. I give you a gift and you do something for me. Nice Scott said. Anyway, this went on. Now, the point about this, this silk route is that it cuts through the Chinese civilization, the so-called Central Asian civilization, the Indian civilization, the West Asian civilization, the Greco-Roman civilization. So at the end of the day, the historian is saying, but it's also porous. It's easy to cut through. It's easy to take trade across. So why are we making such a fuss about boundaries? That becomes problematic for civilizations. It also becomes problematic if you argue that every civilization has its own pertinent characteristics which are self-created. And you sit and think, a civilization like Central Asia, or the culture of people living in northwestern and northwestern parts of the subcontinent, are they all self-created, or are they bits and pieces of these cultures that travel with the goods that go into the making of the local culture? So the notion of self-created cultures that forming to and constituting a civilization, that notion comes to be questioned. Um, religion and language, we now know, are very mixed up. If there's one thing that the study of linguistics has taught us, and that is that just not knowing the language, but, but pulling it apart, understanding the structure of the language, the grammar, the phonology, how it's made up, where the words come from, and so on, which is a different study from just knowing the language. It comes up with very startling results about the way in which languages come together. Uh, one of the startling results, for example, is, um, to give you a slightly dramatic example, we've all been brought up on the notion that the Rigve, which is the earliest memorial, memorized text of the Vedic corpus, dating back um, to about 1500, 1200 BC, but according to others, dating back to the fourth, fifth millennium BC, uh, which few, a date which few historians accept. But even if it's dating back to, let's say, 1500 BC, we've all been brought up on the idea that the Rig Ved has been written in the purest of pure <coughs> Sanskrit, Indo-Aryan of the earliest time. Now, the linguistic studies of the Rig Veda are telling us that it has a mixture of Dravidian. Some of the grammatical structure, some of the words, have elements of the old Dravidian. And there are other people who are now arguing that it might even have elements of Munda, the language that was both Dravidian and Munda, were languages that were spoken in uh, Central India, possibly Western India, and certainly Dravidian becomes the main language of South India. Now, if this is so, at the moment it's being discussed by various people, and it's a very interesting departure as far as the study of uh, the Aryan languages, the Indo-Aryan languages is concerned. If this is so, what does it suggest? Why would languages get mixed up? 
things, yes? Were we just a very confused people? You don't know which language we were speaking? Migration? Sorry? I can't. Trade. All right. But trade only comes in if you can say these are the goods that were traded. But surely it suggests to you that these are two bodies of language speakers who are living together. The integration of two bodies of language speakers. In fact, they might even have been emerged out of this living together. Now, it raises, therefore, a whole set of new historical questions about things like the presence of the Aryan speakers in India. This is an issue on which there is a debate. Among historians, there is a debate as to was there, in fact, such a large degree of interlinking between Indo-Aryan and Dravidian. And then the historian goes on to say that if there was that, then what are the historical implications, the cultural implications? Who is speaking which language? And how is this interlinking taking place? As against this, for those for whom the Rig Veda still remains a language of pure, unsullied um, Vedic Sanskrit Indo Aryan, there is a rejection of all this other evidence and a return to the position that they are taking. Uh, that all Aryan speakers, in fact, all Indians in the year 3000 BC were Aryans, and they were all speaking pure Indo-Aryan. And this is one of the issues on which uh, some of us are being heavily targeted, because we are described as being anti-national. Now, that's a very interesting term, because what is happening over here is that religion, language, and nationalism are all being mixed up. Why should you be described as being anti-national if you say that there was a very interesting situation where Aryan speakers and Dravidian speakers were living together and interacting with each other? That's not anti-national. You can make a historical issue. But anyway, that's just to give you a flavor of what the, uh, how things are. And then, of course, the question of religion. Now, we all know that religion is fascinating to study because it is so mixed up. That everybody's religion affects everybody else's religion. There is no such thing as a pure, unsullied history. And uh, this is, it's becoming like a kind of chorus in this debate because the historians keep on saying, but you know, these things are rather mixed up. And it is for us to try and discover where the mixtures are taking place, why the mixtures are taking place, and what form the mixtures are, take, are, are taking. Because this is fascinating. This is a very, very interesting aspect of the creation of society, culture, history, what have you. And against this, we are faced with a war of people who say, no, there were no mixtures. Everything was absolutely pure, steady, uh, linear progression from the beginning right up to where we are today. Everybody was Aryan, and it all went uh, straight down in a line of Aryan descent. Everybody being Aryan is another complicated issue because remember that Aryan is a language label. It is a label that is applied to those that speak Indo-Aryan languages or spoke Indo-Aryan languages many, many uh, centuries ago. Because today, um, the majority of Indians do speak languages derived from Indo-Aryan, which are all these languages barring the ones derived from Dravidian. Uh, but goodness knows, ethnically, we are completely mixed up over the centuries. A lot of mixtures have taken place, whether it's Central Asians coming into the Northwest, whether it's people from um, e the East coming into Eastern India, whether it's people coming into South India, 
with trade and with, uh, with even invasions and with missions and goodness knows what, lot of close contact, uh, there's been a huge mixture. Therefore, you cannot use the word Aryan in any way as in any racial or ethnic sense. So when you say the Aryan people, or you say all Indians were Aryan, that's a slightly doubtful expression in historical terms, uh, because you're then saying that they all spoke an Indo-Aryan language, which in fact is not what you're saying. Uh, people who say that all Indians were Aryans and the Aryans were indigenous to India and so on, are really talking about racial and ethnic groups. And we know, of course, racial groups don't exist. This was a myth of the 19th century, which we've carried on with and haven't completely thrown over. But nevertheless, that, that creates a problem. So if there is, if cultures are that mixed, um, and going on from that to the issue of knowledge, you, what I mentioned earlier, civilized people are people that deal with philosophy and science and, and deal with uh, the arts and literature and so on. If you go on to that, the history of knowledge is again a history in which all kinds of people participate in the making of knowledge. If you look at the history of mathematics and astronomy, you will find that the mixture is Indians, Arabs, Chinese, Greeks, at least. And a lot of this mixture is taking place in the area of what we today call West Asia. Places like Baghdad were major centers where there were translations going on from Greek into Arabic, from Arabic into Sanskrit, from Sanskrit into Arabic, from Chinese into Arabic, or from Arabic into Chinese, or whatever. The hub of knowledge is a place, inevitably, that is terribly mixed up. And it's not surprising that some of the most interesting astronomical observatories are built subsequently in Central Asia, where a lot of astronomy is developed, because you've got all these trends coming in from all sides into parts of what we today call Central Asia. So um, the concept of civilization, which divided up the world, which kept the world separate, and made it absolutely indistinguishable is a concept that we today are um, really not accepting in the way in which was, it was accepted half a century ago. It has been very seriously questioned. That doesn't mean that cultures don't produce characteristic forms. They may do so. But what is being questioned is that are these characteristic forms entirely self-created, independent, self-sufficient, or are they forms that emerge out of the interaction of many features that have gone on in, in the past? Let me turn to colonial scholarship um, and just mention a few things that I think are still hanging around with us today, which we haven't been able to get rid of, try as we might. Um, the attempt of colonial scholarship was to try and put India, or the Indian past rather, into a framework that it could understand. Here they are in the midst of what they regard as a completely alien culture, an alien civilization in their terms. How are they to understand it? So one of the ways in which you understand it is that you recreate that history and culture in a format, um, a theoretical format that you are familiar with, and then you see it from that point of view. So there is, first of all, a search for chronology, which they arrive at. There is a search for a sequential narrative what happened in the beginning, and then, and then, and then, and then, right up till now. So that becomes very important. 
they're constantly looking for sequential narratives and chronologies of Indian history from the beginnings to the 19th century in the Sanskrit texts. And of course, they don't find them. Because pre-modern cultures did not write their histories in the same way as the Greeks and the Romans did. They wrote their histories in different ways. Um, in fact, the most, um, the, 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 the most, the purest form of chronology and sequential narrative is not Greek historical writing, it is Chinese historical writing. They're far more careful about chronology and about the validity of the events they're recording than even the Greeks were. Uh, Herodotus is always called the father of history and uh, my mentor in Greco-Roman history also had a tremendous influence on me in terms of the need to look for the history of people that lived in the past times who wrote their, their history differently. He was a, a Greek scholar called uh, Momiliano, Arnaldo Momiliano. And Momiliano used to always say, Herodotus is the father of gossip. He's not the father of history. But when it comes to the Chinese sources, if you read the writings, uh, the, even the earlier writings of Ohan Shu and so on, and so on, the, the starkness with which date and event follows, and the uh, way in which they're constantly saying, I get this evidence from such and such, it, it's not like Herodotus who says he met somebody in the marketplace in, in Athens who said he came from Persia, and he told me the story, and the story becomes part of the history. Chinese are not like that. So they are really the ones who are the exemplars from the ancient world as far as, as this kind of history goes. Um, the first history that colonial scholarship comes up with is the very famous history of James Mill, called the History of British India, uh, written in the period from 1818 to 1823. And that sets out the stage, as it were, for colonial scholarship. Mill's big period, uh, big contribution to the study of Indian history was his periodization. Now, periodization is very important because you can't study the whole length of uh, a country's history. You divide it up into sections, convenient sections. These can either be chronological sections or they can be sections where certain events happen in a particular way. Mill is the first person ever and please note, he's not an Indian, he's a colonial, he's British. He's the first person who divides Indian history into Hindu civilization, Muslim civilization, and the British period. And how does he divide this? He talks about the religion of the dynasties. From our point of view today, probably the least important aspect of the study of the past. Who cares what the religion of dynasties was when there's the whole of society to be studied? But for them, it was very important. So you have these three periods. And he goes on to say that the Hindu and the Muslim were two peoples that became two nations and were constantly hostile to each other. So you have this axiom in colonial historiography that the history of India consists of the Hindu period, the Muslim period, and the British. And the Hindu and the Muslim period are times when Hindus and Muslims are constantly hostile to each other. Because they are two nations fighting for the same territory. You remember the whole discussion of partition? There's a thread running through there. It's quite interesting. Um, the units of society are therefore monolithic religious communities. And the construction of these communities becomes very important. Naturally, you have to define them. So, you've got the construction of the Muslim community related immediately 
to Islam in West Asia. Not realizing that Islam in India in pre-modern times was very different from Islam in West Asia. The two cannot be put into the same basket. Uh, when you consider, for example, that there was an immense amount of intermarriage here, there is community after community down the west coast of India of uh, descent from Arab traders marrying locally, and the Islam that emerges is a mix, such a mix that people in the heartland of places like Alava and so on don't recognize them as Muslims. They say they are practicing some strange religion. And certainly the West Asian Arab Muslims uh, regard them as mixed up people. So instead of saying that this is a different branch of Islam, and let's look at it and see the difference, it's immediately categorized as identical with West Asian Islam. What to do with the Hindus? Because remember there was no, the, 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 the word Hindu that was used uh, is a word of Arab extraction. When the Arabs first came into contact with uh, India as traders, they knew the geography of the place, they knew it geographically as Al-Hind. And Hind comes from Sindhu, comes from Indus, comes from uh, the Persian and the, the Sanskrit and the Greek words for the Indus River. So the people living across the Indus River from the point of view perspective of the Arabs were called, the area was called Al-Hind, and the people were called Hindi and Hindu. The two terms were used interchangeably for the people, not the religion. When you started having uh, states created where the dynasties were Muslim, that is from about the 14th, 15th century onwards, there was a need to describe the population. And so you had a split between the believers, the Muslims, and the non-believers, the Hindus. The geographical term was transferred to a religious concept. Now this is very evident. It's been written about at great length and so on. We seldom uh, refer to it for obvious reasons. Um, because there's a certain contradiction in saying the term Hindu. And then the British use of that term as Hinduism, creating one religion out of this multiplicity of sects within Vaishnavism, Shaivism, Shaktism, and so on, Buddhist, Jain, Buddhist was a very few left, but Jains, uh, Shaktas, all these sects that called each other by sectarian names. You never had, until the 16th century, uh, people belonging to these sects who called themselves Hindu. Eknath in Maharashtra is amongst the first few people that talks about a Hindu Turk uh, Sambad, where he uses the word Hindu to mean non-Muslim. So there is, a, there is a history to these terms, and it is important to look at that history to realize what the evolution is. It's not as if the word Hindu was used from Vedic times onwards, not at all. It is a recent invention, and Hinduism, as an English terminology, is an even more recent invention. But it's perfectly legitimate to use the term to refer to what you think are all these sets. Now, because of this kind of inventing that is going on um, by colonial scholars, you get the logical construction out of Hinduism of an attempt to create a religion that is following the format of the Judeo-Christian. If colonial scholarship is trying to format Indian articulation in a way they can understand, and does so by inventing <coughs> Hinduism, then you get a further invention, which is even more opposite to our times, namely uh, an invention that relates religion to political understanding. 
And so in the 20th century, you begin to get the link between religion and political condition. Now, let me just jump a little bit and say, yes, what is happening in the 20th century? Nationalism has come into existence um, from the 19th century. It's, it's very much uh, a movement that is um, anti-colonial. It begins with demanding representation. It then goes on to demanding more representation, changing the structure of the bodies. And then ultimately, in uh, the 1900s, it is essentially, therefore, anti-colonial. The main nationalism that develops in the late 19th century with the formation of the Indian National Congress. But in addition to this, there are two what some people have called sub-nationalisms, which are religious in content, or supposedly religious in content, but aimed at politics, again, aimed at the creation of new nations. What is nationalism? Nationalism is really the ideology and the movement that is aspiring to create a new nation. Out of the uh, confrontation with colonialism, you get anti-colonial nationalism, which is inclusive. Everybody comes together, everybody joins it, because you're throwing out the colonial power and you're creating a new nation. But the sub-nationalisms are going a step further and wanting other nations, other than this single uh, anti-colonial nation that the big nationalism is fighting for. And there what happens is then that Mill's division of the Hindu and the Muslim nations, the two nation theory, is avidly picked up. It's picked up by two bodies. It's picked up by the Muslim League and by the Hindu Mahasabha. They're the ones that keep on talking about the legitimacy of the two nation theory. So it's all very well, let's get rid of the British. Let's get rid of the colonial power, but we must replace uh, the British colony by two nations, one Islamic and the other Hindu. And in the 1920s, these two bodies begin to be formed, begin to get active. By the 1930s, uh, you've got people writing about Pakistan on the one hand, where all the Muslims will go to and create an Islamic state, and Hindu Rashtra, on the other hand, where all the Hindus will be and create a Hindu state. And the people who are busy writing about this uh, are particularly true. Savarkar, to begin with. Uh, interesting man because he was really quite a radical in his young age and he was then imprisoned by the British in the Andamans and the records that are now being revealed are his writing to the British and promising them total subservience and service if they would only release him from prison. Uh, the letters are really quite interesting as human doctors. And so it's not surprising that in a way he becomes one of the major voices in this demand for Hindu Rashtra countering the Muslim B. And one kind of suspects that this is not just the legacy of James Mill, but possibly there is, possibly, one doesn't know, but possibly there is some intervention somewhere of a British interest in encouraging. I mean, the British are on record. British colonialism follows a pattern right through the world, wherever it's had a colony, which is that of divide and rule. And we all know it, and we've all referred to it 101 times. Uh, whether it's the Israel and the Arabs, the Jews and the Arabs, whether it's the Turks and the Cypriots, uh, whether it's anywhere in Africa, one is full of these dual divisions that are now surfacing. And that always happens. Once the main nationalism comes into effect, then these sub-nationalisms become extremely important in making their demands. And what is the form that this new politicalized 
Hinduism takes, it is Hindutva. The argument is, of course, that um, in this construction of the new religion, um, there were problems when the, 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 the Hindu religion as such was compared to the Judeo-Christian and other Semitic religions. There's no historical founder. This is a major problem. The others all have historical founders. The Buddhists and the Jains have historical founders, but there is no historical founder of the Hindu religion. Now, some of us, I, for example, think that that's the greatness of this religion. That is what makes it unique and different. And I'm saddened by the fact that people who are scholars of religion and who are historians of religion have not really looked at this religion in terms of this is very different from the European experience. Uh, why don't we examine it and see how it's different? And did this difference affect the history of this religion uh, right through from whenever to now? Similarly, like the Chinese, the Chinese religion is totally different from the European, but totally. And it would be very interesting to see whether the Chinese religion has any uh, similarities with what happened in the Indian case. And instead of treating this as, you know, an intellectual and a theoretical and an analytical area to investigate and to come up with very interesting uh, uh, results, as it inevitably will, there is a tendency to go on pushing it, pushing it further and further into a known model which has been accepted as the superior model for religious articulation. So there's no founder, there's no single sacred book. A problem that arose in the law courts of Bengal in the 19th century, when everybody was ready, the Christians were ready to swear on the Bible, the Muslims were ready to swear on the Quran. What would the Hindus swear on? So there was a debate, should it be the Ramayana, should it be the Mahabharata, should it be the Vedas, should it be the Bhagavad Gita? And finally, people said, well, maybe, maybe the Gita, and that has become kind of conventional. And I see recently someone's challenged it in court, saying, I'm an atheist, I would swear by the Indian constitution, I would not swear by the Gita. Uh, but these are issues that, you know, they all have histories, and they don't have immediate histories. You have to think about the whole business of how did it get to this point where there was this debate on which is the Hindu sacred book. There's no church. Everybody worships exactly where they want to. Some go to a temple. Some are not allowed to come to the temple. That's the other interesting thing about this religion, that it is so that it keeps out people, which is a very unreligious thing to do, because most religions are desperately anxious to convert. And now, of course, that they've started this business of conversion, they're in a mess, because there is no where in any text of Hinduism where conversion is uh, talked about or permitted. It's a completely alien idea to this religion. So there are many aspects of it which, you know, historically, anthropologically, and theologically are very interesting and need to be investigated, but that is not the case. There's no congregation of worship. It's individual. You go in and you worship as and when you like. You worship whichever deity you like. There is no compulsion even on that. And there is, of course, no conversion. You are born into a particular caste, and that's the heavy hand of predetermination, uh, which has been a big, big problem. But added to this whole religious thing, of course, was 1872, the first census of India, um, from which the data that was extracted led to the notion of the majority community and the minority communities a notion, strictly speaking, colonial in essence. Nobody before, anywhere in the subcontinent, had talked about majorities and minorities in religious terms. 
And immediately, of course, this notion was picked up for politics, and there were demands that all kinds of concessions be made to various communities. Anyway, this is a little bit of the background, and what you finally get with the emergence of Hindutva, uh, which some of us had predicted in the course of our, our, our battles and our writings and so on, um, but people said we were being alarmist and statist and goodness knows what, but you had a feel of this in the first NDA government when the attack was on textbooks for not being sufficiently Hindu, uh, for trying to be what they call pseudo-secular. Um, and then, of course, in the last one year, one has seen the manifestation of the politics of Hindutva to a much greater extent. Okay, very briefly, uh, two other features which I think are important from colonial scholarship and have a bearing even to our attitudes today. Uh, one was the conviction of people like Mill and many other uh, European and British writers writing on Indian history in the 19th century that Indian society was the society of oriental despotism. This was applied to the whole of Asia. Asia was dismissed as being totally despotic, never known anything but despotism. Uh, what did this mean? It meant, first of all, despotic rulers, and so you had this pyramidal structure. The peasantry at the base, that did all the labor, produced what was required, the bureaucracy that creamed the production away and took it to the high point of the pyramid, which was the despotic ruler, who was extremely wealthy. And that's really when all these stories, um, Arabian Nights type stories about the despotic rulers come into European literature. People with oodles of money and wealth, and all they did was to drink and uh, cavort around with dancing girls and live in palaces of marble and that kind of thing. Then they went on to say, because of that, because all of the wealth was taken and given to this one person, along the line shared by the, bureaucr the, the bureaucracy as it went its way up, uh, there was endemic poverty. So the poverty of the colony today is the fault of its despotic rulers. Nobody talked about the fact that you had a colonial economy which drained the wealth of the country, uh, took it off, and in a sense, as some people have argued, almost financed the Industrial Revolution of Britain, for example, in the Indian case. Nobody brought that into consideration. That was considered seditious. But the theory was that endemic poverty existed before it became a colony. Um, and the, the way in which the despot kept control was because there was an absence of private property in land. Nobody was allowed to own land. Therefore, nobody had the ambition to break away, to revolt, and that kind of thing. And remember, this is 17th, 18th, 19th century, the 18th century in France, where there'd been this huge debate on private property in land, and in England also. So it was a very current subject, and that was brought in, and they said that in Asian societies there's no private property. Uh, this, incidentally, is the kind of data on which you get uh, Karl Marx's famous Asiatic mode of production, which fortunately has been thrown out by its hind legs, was thrown out many, many decades ago as being completely fantasy and unreal. But it's that kind, it typifies the kind of thinking of colonial times. The other very important aspect of this kind of thinking is that the society was static, nothing changed. Over the centuries, it remained exactly the same. It went from one despotic ruler to the next, and that was the system was the same. Therefore, since there was no change in society, it had no history. History, after all, is the study of change. 
of essentially how societies change. Whether you write it up as a narrative or whether you analyze it, that is what history is concerned with. So it had no history, therefore, colonial scholarship had to discover its history and write its history. So they gave themselves the right to recreate, reformulate the history of India, which they did very effectively, and which, as I say to this day, uh, is still up to a point living with us, despite the fact that historians have questioned it. Um, that becomes an important aspect also of uh, the battle today between professional historians and uh, some public views of history. If there is an absence of history and it has to be recreated, who does the recreating and how do they do the recreating? And that is what I talk about when I talk about the method of writing history. The other aspect which is very important to colonial scholarship is, of course, that they don't know what to do with caste. They've never come across a society which was conditioned by caste. They can understand status, they can understand class, but caste is something which is very difficult to comprehend. And therefore, the first reaction is to say, Varna is race. And this is a very scientific society because they segregated people by race. You have four races. Each varna constitutes a separate race. Um, and each one has its inbuilt uh, hierarchy. Or there is, in fact, a hierarchy even among the four. This, they soon realized, didn't really work out. And, of course, when racial theories began to be questioned in Europe, the application of racial theories to past also uh, declined. But it always remained a bit of a question mark, and there was a tendency, therefore, to depend on the normative texts, the dharma shastras, and say that's how caste functions. And this tendency of treating the normative text as a descriptive text of society is something that was picked up by Indian nationalist historians as well, most of whom, of course, were from the upper castes, and therefore they said this is simply uh, a description of how society worked in the past. And there was really very little careful analysis of a caste society as a society very different from uh, the society that at least colonial scholarship was, was uh, in this. But lest you think that I'm just making them all out to be devils, uh, let me quickly add that there was some very useful work done in historical research by colonial scholarship. They did systematically sit down and decipher the scripts, the ancient scripts that were unread. And the decipherment of the Brahmi script as early as 1837 changed a lot of historical thinking in the 20th century. They deciphered the scripts, they read the inscriptions, but the readings were very limited. But it is when we come to the 20th century that the inscriptions, and we have a huge body of inscriptions. In fact, the inscriptional material is in some ways, from the historical point of view, and for the work of the historian, the inscription material is as important as the textual material. And therefore, this decipherment of the inscriptions becomes extremely important in the 20th century. They started excavations. Um, Archaeology was a new discipline in Europe, and here was, you know, open ground where nobody had ever thought about archaeology before. And so the techniques were brought over. And Alexander Cunningham, for example, who was an engineer by training, who read the account that the Chinese pilgrim, Hyun Siang, makes of his visit to India. Hyun Siang is actually brilliant because he gives his itinerary. And he measures distances and says, 
I was in such and such a place, and then I went so many li, uh, which is a Chinese measure, northeast, and arrived in such and such a place where there were three very important Buddhist stupas. And he gives a little description of the place and who so on. And Cunningham more or less took this book in his hand and sort of said, all right, this is where he's located. And he says, I went northeast. So he goes that many steps northeast, and finds a mound, and starts digging the mound. And this old stupa <coughs> appears. So they did a lot of that, which was absolutely fundamental, as we now find it, to research. Mind you. The reading of those monuments is another matter, but then that is